Pastor Kevin along here with you on Wednesday night. Joyce Ann is here with me as well. She's just waving there. And uh, she is here with me tonight as well. And uh, we're glad to have you there on this uh, Bible study for December 30, 2020. And um, I tell you, this is not only the last Wednesday of the month, it's the last Wednesday of the year. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be saying goodbye, and some would probably say good riddance to 2020. So, yes. you know, and, and i tell you what, um, a lot of people have said a lot of things about, you know, 2021 and what it might hold. Um, I tell you, we, we're just believing for good things in 2020, or 2021, pardon me, we're not, we're not going to do 2020 over again, okay? Uh, 2021, uh, we're just believing for good things to come yes. this year because no matter what, you know what, God is on his throne, Jesus is Lord, and a good evening to Amy, and good evening to any, anyone else who's jumping on tonight, and uh, we are so appreciative of that, but um, I tell you what, we believe for good things ahead in 2020, 2020, I keep saying 2020, 2021, not going back in time, I'll tell you. Maybe I'd better just drop this line of reading, uh, reasoning here and go on. But uh, anyway, praise the Lord. All right, hey, let's have a word of prayer. And uh, we are on part two of a brand new series we began last week that we've entitled The Holy Spirit and his gifts. This is part two of that new teaching. So let's have a word of prayer and then let's get right into the word, all right? <clears throat> Pardon me. Father, we just thank you for your holy word tonight. Holy Spirit, we ask you to open the word to our understanding tonight. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what thus saith the Holy Ghost to us tonight. Help us to hide the word in our heart <clears throat> pardon me, that we might not sin against you, Lord. Help us to take your word and walk in the light of it. And we thank you for this opportunity to share your word in this way, on this medium, with your people as we gather in fellowship around your word and with one another here in, uh, in on Facebook Live. And so we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we, of course, believe for that blessing, whether a person watches this a little bit later, maybe on YouTube, maybe a little later on uh, on Facebook here. But uh, regardless, you know, the Word of God, uh, the power of the Word of God uh, will touch your life. The Word says in Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the Word of a king is, there is power. So there is power in the Word of God tonight to do what you need done in your life. Amen. Well, uh, as I said, we're on part two of the Holy Spirit and his gifts, and um, I got thinking about the move of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and really, when we think about church history, there have been three great outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, Pentecost, 33 AD, that was where the church was born, but I mean... Uh, three great outpourings of the Holy Spirit that have shaped the landscape, really, of the modern church. First of all, there was a eight, in 1898 a revival near Murphy, North Carolina, spilling over into eastern Tennessee, later forming the Church of God and Church of God of Prophecy denominations. Then a second revival in 1900 in the Midwest in Topeka, Kansas, at Charles Parham's Bible School when they decided that they were going to study what the initial physical evidence of one being baptized with or filled with the Holy Spirit, what the initial physical evidence, and they set themselves to prayer and the study of the Word, and they determined that the initial physical evidence of being filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit was the speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And then at midnight, um, I believe it was either midnight 1898 or 1899 in there, 
uh, or pardon me, 1900, midnight on, in 1900, um, a young lady uh, by the name of Agnes Osmond in the Bible school at Topeka, Kansas, Charles Parham's Bible school, received the infilling of the Holy Spirit in, with speaking in other tongues. And so that was a great outpouring of the Spirit. And then following that, some months later, beginning in 19, well, I guess some years later, but starting in 1906, the Holy Spirit began to be poured out in Los Angeles, California, in a move the Holy Spirit, of course, that became to be, came to be referred to as the Azusa Street Revival. Now, this revival that lasted from 1906 to 1915 saw literally tens of thousands of lives transformed in these meetings, and as a result of the spiritual climate created by this visitation, helped reverse the spiritual and moral decline that had set in in many rural towns and cities for a season of time. And I have to say, may the Holy Spirit do it again. Hallelujah. Yes. We need, folks, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We need a fresh visitation of the Spirit in mm -hmm. our churches, in our lives. Um, you know, I got to thinking about, I, I think it was the 2016 presidential cycle. It may have been back farther than that. But uh, Billy Brim and her folks there at Prayer Mountain in the Ozarks, they were seeking the Lord. And they were seeking the Lord about the election that year, that cycle. And the word of the Lord came to Billy Brim and said this, the thing that will save America is not the election. The thing that will save America is an awakening to God. And that's still true. Yes. The thing yes. that will make the difference in this nation of ours is a, an awakening to God. Now, we need two things. And these are the two things that the Spirit of the Lord stirred my heart to begin to pray about two years ago. He began to stir my heart to pray for two specific things. Number one, for awakening in the community. And that is that people in the community would awaken, that's what an awakening is, that they would awaken to their need for God. And then secondly, the thing that he stirred my heart to pray and to lead in prayer in was revival in the church. You see, revival is for the saved because what happens is as sometimes as we go along we begin to get spiritually lethargic we begin to get spiritually dull if you will yes and we need a fresh stirring we need a fresh infilling and that's where revival comes you know if you were out swimming and you uh, started to go down and and you got water in your lungs and they pull you up on the shore and they pump that water out of you and get you breathing again. You are revived. See, revive, when you're revived, you live again. Praise God. You lived yes. at one time, but now you live again. Well, and that now when it comes to awakening, people in the world who aren't saved, who don't have a covenant relationship with God, they need to be awakened to their need for God. Amen. Every person in the world needs God. Amen. Yes. Now, they may not realize yes. it. They may not think they do, but they do. They need God. They need a relationship with God. They need to be born again. We'll say more about that in a little bit. But anyway, our denomination, uh, the Church of God of Prophecy that I'm a part of, that our church is a part of here in Boone, the Boone Church of God of Prophecy, C-O-G-O-P, has its roots in the Wesleyan, what is known as the Wesleyan Holiness Movement that was just prior to the 20th century. Now, there was a teaching that came out of that movement known as the Second Blessing or the Second Work of Grace. Now, what that teaching basically said was this, that after salvation, there could come a, a point, an experience with the Holy Spirit where one was completely sanctified or set apart for God. Now, we need to talk about that word sanctification because 
It's a big word. It's a theological word. It's a biblical word. But what it means to be sanctified means to be set apart. That's what holiness means. It means to be set apart for God. And so what our leadership received some additional light on this and what, what they saw, and I believe the Bible teaches, what they saw is that um, even though while there is an instantaneous aspect to sanctification, in other words, when one is saved, when one comes into a covenant relationship with God, when one is born again, that's a biblical term, when one is born again, the Holy Spirit, through an act of grace, separates the sinner from sin, separates that sinner from their old life, and causes them to be set apart. Formerly they were for a profane purpose, living in sin, and then the Holy Spirit in sanctification causes us to be then in turn separated unto God. Hallelujah. Well, there is, an, there is an instantaneous aspect of that. The moment we're saved, the Holy Spirit separates us unto God. We are sanctified. But what our leadership found additional light on in the Word was that sanctification is also a progressive thing where a believer grows and develops in holiness or sanctification. Now, I said all that to say this, okay? <laughs> While I don't particularly subscribe to second blessing or second work of grace theology, I do see in the word that there is an experience, okay? A work of the Holy Spirit after salvation known as being filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. And let me say this, every person needs both works of the Holy Spirit. Every person needs both works of the Holy Spirit. That is, every person needs to first be born of the Spirit. You know, I uh, heard the other day, or read, I guess I should say, about a well-known minister who had gone on the Larry King show, and Larry King asked this minister, he said, if someone does not accept Christ as Savior and Lord, if they do not receive Jesus, are they going to heaven? And this well-known minister said, you know, I, I can't answer that. I can't answer that. I can't say who's going to heaven and who's not. I can't say who's saved and who's not. But let me tell you this, not, not speaking disparagingly of anyone, but if anyone asks me, okay, if someone doesn't receive Jesus, if they don't accept Christ, can they be saved? I don't want to mince any words here. No, they cannot. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Watch this. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I don't know how you can get any clearer than that. The Bible also says in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no, may, no name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. It is Jesus or an eternity separated from God. That, that, that's Bible, okay? That's what the Bible teaches. And I know, go ahead. We're family. Yeah. Okay. And we have children. Mm-hmm. We love our children. Our children has given us their love. Mm -hmm. Our children has given us um, their time, <laughs> their money on Christmas. They always give us a gift card or, or they buy us something. And they have given. They have called. They've talked to us. They've told us they love us. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is with God. Yeah. We as his children, his children, we were bought with a price. Mm -hmm. Just like our children was bought with uh, being born in us or adopted to us. Mm -hmm. We were bought with a price, a very big price. Yep. His only son gave his life for us. And, you know, 
I don't think he's going to want to take care of the devil's children. No, no. Well, every person needs to receive Jesus. Now, he, as Joy Sand said, Jesus paid an awful price for our redemption, for our salvation. And, you know, if we take that gift or a person takes that gift that he offers and just says, nope, don't want it, no thanks, and just kind of throws it aside, well, that's a great insult to God and to the blood of Jesus. But let me just say this. Every person needs to be born of, of, of the Spirit. Every person. Nicodemus, a very religious man, he came to Jesus by night, the Bible says in John's Gospel, chapter 3, and he, you know, came and he was talking to Jesus, and Jesus cut right to the chase, cut right to what he needed, right to the heart of the matter, if you will. And Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter or he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's it. Amen. So every person needs to be born of the Spirit, and every person born of the Spirit then in turn needs to be filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every person who is born of the Spirit needs to then be filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I recognize the fact, okay? I've been around in ministry, in Christian service long enough that I recognize the fact some would disagree with that statement that I made and even take exception with it. In fact, many teach that we already have all the Spirit or have received all His work at salvation. Now, is that what the Bible teaches? Is this what the Bible teaches? Well, I say no, but it's not enough for me to say no. We're going to see that the Bible sets forth that there is a work of the Spirit in salvation, but right on the other hand, there is a work of the Spirit in being filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, one of my favorite verses of Scripture, I know it's one of Joy Sand's favorite uh, verses of Scripture, is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where the Bible says... Um, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, here it is, rightly, rightly dividing, dividing the word of truth. truth. Rightly dividing yes. the word of truth. Now, it's Amen. always stood out to me that if one could rightly divide the word, then you can wrongly, wrongly. divide yes. the word, and yes. many do, unfortunately. Yes. But here it is. This is one of the areas when it comes to this doctrine of the Holy Spirit and his gifts, this doctrine of being born of the Spirit, then being filled with the Spirit, this is an area where rightly dividing the word comes in big time, I don't mind telling you. Now, part of the confusion when it comes to these matters, part of the confusion comes from misunderstanding terminology, okay? Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2, we're not going to go there right now, but Hebrews 6, 2 refers to the doctrine of baptisms, plural, as a foundational teaching. The doctrine of baptism. This tells us then that there is more than one baptism. Now, it's important we understand this, and I got to thinking about this right off the top of my head. I can think of three baptisms set forth in the Word of God. Number one, there's water baptism. Now, you'll recall that Jesus came to John the Baptist to the Jordan River, and he said, baptize me now to fulfill all righteousness. John didn't want to baptize him. He said, no. He says, Lord, I have need to be baptized of thee. And Jesus said, no. Suffer it to be so now to fulfill all righteousness. Then we know that, that John baptized Jesus in the Jordan. We know the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily shape like a dove. And the vo voice of the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We also read of the Ethiopian eunuch in uh, Acts chapter 8 who Philip the evangelist went up to him. He was sitting in a chariot reading the prophet Isaiah and starting at that the it was the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant passage and what we would know is Isaiah 53. 
He started there and preached the gospel to this Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch ended up getting saved. And the Bible says that he says, what, what hinders me from being baptized? They stopped in a body of water. He baptized, and we know the Bible talks about that. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, he that believeth and is baptized refers to baptism in water. That symbolizes, watch this, the old man of sin being buried and then being risen to walk in newness of life. So the Bible speaks of baptism in water. Then secondly, the Bible speaks of the baptism into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I'm just going to read this reference for you. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? So this is the baptism into the body of Christ. And then, thirdly, there is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, over in uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, I'm just going to read this to you for, you know, sake of time here. But it says, and being assembled together with them, that is the disciples, the 120 disciples that made their way into the upper room that we read about in Acts chapter 2, uh, chapter 1, and then in chapter 2. But the Bible says, and being assembled together with them, the 120 disciples, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. That's again Acts 1, 4, and 5. And then a similar thought is over in Luke 24, 49, where the Bible says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, there are a couple of things to notice here that will clear the notion of the doctrine of baptism up, doctrine of baptisms up for us and help us to rightly divide the word. In all three of these baptisms, there, there are some things they have in common. Uh, what we see is there is a, an agent, there is an agent, and B, an element. There is an agent and there is an element. Now, in water baptism, it's clear that the element is the water. That is the thing being baptized into. In water baptism, you are being baptized into water. The water is the element that you're being baptized into. That, that's clear. The agent in water baptism would be the minister who, or whoever is administering baptism. They would be the agent. So the element would be the water. The minister or the person baptizing would be the agent. Okay, that's that's clear. Now let's go on though. Um, it's on these other two baptisms that confusion comes in. There are those, for example, who would take that 1213 passage and say that it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and it occurs at salvation. Well, let's read that passage again. This time I'm going to ask you to turn to it. If you have your Bibles right there, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. All right, let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now, I wanted you to see this because I'm going to call your attention to a couple of things here. All right, so 1 Corinthians 10, 13, or 12, 13, pardon me, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Bible says this. Now, pay attention to this terminology because words are important, okay? It says, for by, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews, 
whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So look at that again. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. So we have by and we have into. He says by one spirit, and he says into one body. All right? So it's clear, watch this now, in this baptism, the agent is the Holy Spirit. Didn't he say, for by one spirit, that makes the spirit the agent, or the spirit the baptizer in this baptism, and the element is the body of Christ, because he says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So, this is not the baptism of, in the Holy Spirit, this would be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those terms are, are important. Why? Because in this baptism in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, what is going on here, it's a very supernatural thing. That is, when one is born again, when one makes Jesus the Lord of their life, what the Holy Spirit does, and it is a work of the Spirit, he takes you and he separates you from sin, he separates you from the world, and he baptizes you, that is, places you into the body of Christ. Yes. So the Holy Spirit takes you from the world, from the kingdom of darkness, he transfers you over into the kingdom of light, and then by a supernatural work, he takes you and places you into the body of Christ, or he baptizes you into the body of Christ. Now, what about the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit? Well, it's clear in this baptism that the element is the Holy Spirit. In other words, the thing you are being baptized into or immersed in, that's what the word baptism means. It, it's, from, it's a transliteration of the Greek baptizo, and it means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. And so it is to dip, to plunge, immerse, cover you, envelop you uh, in and with the Holy Spirit. Yes. What about the agent? in this case. Well, let's look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 8. Who is identified as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit? If a minister is the agent baptizing someone in water and the Holy Spirit is the agent baptizing someone into the body of Christ, who is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost? Well, come over here to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Um, I'm not sure I got this reference correct, actually. I don't think I did. Um, I apologize. Let me just go over here. Uh, ch uh, chapter 3, verse 11. That, that, that's where I needed to be. I apologize. Chapter 3 and verse 11. After I saw that reference, I could tell it wasn't right. But uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 11. That's where I needed to be. I apologize. I overlooked that when I was putting that together, and I got an incorrect reference. I apologize. Anyway, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, and verse 11. John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, John the Immerser is speaking, and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, he prepared the way for Jesus, so the one coming after him would have been Messiah Jesus. He who cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Watch this. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now come over to a second reference over in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 33. John 1, 33. Let's go over there. Praise the Lord. 
John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 33. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he, watch this, which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So if the element of the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, the one the Bible says is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit is Messiah Jesus. He is the, the agent of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is Jesus, in this baptism, he fills you with, he immerses you in, he covers you with, he fills you with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, what I want to go into and look at now, because it's so important, because you have people who will say that, like I said earlier, that you receive all of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life when you're born again, when you come to faith in Christ and receive Him as Savior and Lord. But I want to, I, I contend, and I believe the Bible contends, that there are two separate experiences. There is salvation and there is the baptism of or in the Holy Spirit. Ba better way to say it is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Salvation and baptism in the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're here to Acts. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8. Here we go. Praise the Lord. Acts, chapter 8. And... Uh, we're going to go down here to verse 5 to start with. I'm going to read down through verse 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 5 starting. And we're going to again read down to 8 initially. Okay, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 beginning at verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And he says in verse 8, or it says in verse 8, pardon me, and there was great joy in that city. Now, these folks were born again under Philip's ministry. How do we know that? Well, holding our place here in Acts chapter 5, flipping back here to Mark's gospel, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Let's look back at that. Now, the Bible says that Philip went down to Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. All right. So Mark 16, 15 and 16, the Bible says, and he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, go in, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. So, so these people, they they, they gave heed, they, they received the word of God, they received what Philip preached, they, they received the gospel, so they were, by Bible definition, they were saved. But watch this as we drop down to the 12th verse, watch this same opening, Acts chapter 8, dropping down to verse 12, watch this, but when they believe Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. So they believed. What did Acts 16.31 say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. What did Jesus say? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
being baptized as a symbol of the fact that you've received Jesus, that you are new on the inside, that you have been born again, then you go into that watery grave of baptism to symbolize on the outside what has occurred on the inside. Amen? Okay, yes, amen. So, so here it is. Here it is. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, verse 14 says, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, okay, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's keep reading yet. Uh, down to verse 17. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they, the apostles, laid their hands on them, and they, the folks in Samaria who had been saved, received the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Now, how do we know, first of all, that these folks were really saved? Well, we go back to verses 5 and 6 of Acts chapter 8. Verses 5 and 6 says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which he spake, or which Philip spake, pardon me, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So they, they received, they received, they received the word of God. First Peter chapter one, uh, one uh, verse, first Peter one twenty three. Let's look at that. Hold your place in Acts eight because we're going to come back to it. Kind of jumping around a lot in the word, but we have to see these things. We have to see them in the word. First Peter chapter one and verse twenty three. Use one two three. First Peter one twenty three. Let's see this in the word, shall we? All right. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Let's see what the Bible says. First Peter 1 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Well, Acts 8.14 tells us that they received the word of God. Uh, 1 Peter 1.23 says that we are saved by the word of God through that incorruptible seed of the word. That's how we're saved. Amen. Uh, not, through, not through corruptible things, but incorruptible. The seed of the word of God. They received the seed of the word of God. Praise God. But watch this. Acts 8.14. Acts 8.14, we're kind of going back and forth. That's why I said to hold your place there. Uh, verse uh, 14 of chapter 8 says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Folks, these people were saved, all right? They had received Jesus. They had been baptized in water. They were born again. But watch this, watch this. The, the Bible says that they sent Peter and John down there to these folks who were saved, who were baptized, who, who received the word of God, and they sent Peter and John to these folks who prayed for them, watch this, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Someone says, well, they'd already received the Holy Ghost. They were saved, yes. There is a work of the Holy Spirit that takes place in the new birth. There's no question of that. You cannot be saved apart from this work of the Spirit that happens at the new birth. I like to say it is a measure of the Spirit. I like to call it the sonship measure of the Spirit. There is very definitely a work of the Holy Spirit that occurs in the new birth. But watch this. But that is not called the baptism in the Holy Spirit or receiving the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The disciples, the believers at Samaria, they'd already received the word of God. They'd already been baptized. They'd already believed. They received the things that Philip spoke. They received the gospel, but they had to 
Yet, there was a second work of the Spirit that they needed to receive, which was the receiving the Holy Spirit in the baptismal, we could call it, measure. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Now, the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in verses 14 through 17, the Bible says Peter and John came down here, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, a lot of people like to seize on the fact, well, look there, you know, we can't say that the Holy Spirit baptism is for today because all of the apostles of the Lamb are dead and, and they had to send Peter and John down there. So just the average believer can't pray for someone to receive the Holy Ghost. Why did they send Peter and John? Why didn't Philip pray for them? Well, listen, this is true back then, and it is true now. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does in ministry, that's why there's so many ministries, quite frankly, is because one of the first things the Holy Spirit does in ministry is he diversifies in ministry. In other words, there are those who are specifically called or have a greater calling in one area over another. For example, mm -hmm. Philip had a great calling in preaching the gospel and getting folks saved. That was his ministry. Philip was an evangelist. And the first thing that an evangelist does now Every ministry office, whether one is an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, any of the ministry offices, what you are or what a ministry office or a ministry gift is, first and foremost, is a preacher and or teacher of the Word of God. But Philip was an evangelist, and so an evangelist's equipment is preaching the gospel and having a special anointing to get people saved. Peter and John, on the other hand, they had a greater anointing in getting people filled with the Holy Spirit. I heard um, Perry Stone say one time recently, he said his father, the late Fred Stone, had a tremendous anointing for healing the sick. He, I mean, he had some tremendous healings of cancer and AIDS and just incurable diseases and miracles that occurred under his ministry. Whereas, although Perry said, hey, people get healed in my ministry too, he said his specific ministry or his greatest anointing is in getting people filled with the Holy Ghost and, and, and teaching the word. But, but, but I mean, you know, comparing the two, uh, Perry's greatest anointing was in getting people filled with the Holy Ghost. He'd have two and three hundred or more at a time in one service filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and Fred Stone says, you know, he says, I ministered for years and I didn't see very many filled with the Holy Spirit, but I saw a lot of folks healed. So Fred Stone had a great anointing in, heal, in healing, in, in healing anointing, whereas Perry's greatest anointing, teaching, of course, but as far as getting people filled or baptized in the Holy Ghost. So this was the same way with Peter and John and Philip. Philip's greatest ministry or anointing was in getting folks into the kingdom of God, getting them saved, whereas Peter and John's greatest ministry was in laying hands on people and seeing them filled with the Holy Spirit. Simple. That's the reason it worked that way. That's the way it works today. There are various callings. There are different anointings. You know, uh, so, so that, that's, that was that. We all have our place and our ministries, and we need to realize that God has called every one of us into service, and if we will get before the Lord and seek Him, He will reveal to our hearts and to our lives what our calling and what our anointing is in the body of Christ, what our place of service is. Okay, um, let me just see here. Now, there was some, now here's something else that people like to seize on. You know, they, they say, well, okay, the, the, the people in Samaria, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible doesn't speak anything in there about tongues in Acts chapter 8. It just says Peter and John prayed for them and they, were, they received the Holy Ghost. Well, let me just point this out. What was it that could be seen because there obviously was some physical evidence, something that could be seen that they had received the Holy Ghost. For example, 
uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 18 says, uh, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them the apostles' money. He saw, in other words, there was some physical evidence that they had received the Holy Ghost. Now, I've had ministers say to me, well, Brother Kevin, maybe it was just that they were filled with joy. After all, uh, love, joy, peace, you know, that the joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So maybe they were just filled with joy. Go ahead, and I'll address that in a minute. Could it be that they were filled with the Shekinah glory or the glory of God so strong that they... Well, I, 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 I'm going to address that. I'm okay. going to address that. I'll shut up. No, that's all right. No, 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 no. It, 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 it's okay. Now, here's the thing. There is a pattern, and we're going to see this in some other scriptures, but there is a pattern set forth in the book of Acts. For example, we have in Acts chapter 2, the 120 gathered in the upper room, and the Bible says, And there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. And the Bible says in that fourth verse, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That was the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost. Now, you come over into Acts chapter 8, you see another group of people receiving the Holy Spirit. Tongues aren't mentioned. But you come over to Acts chapter 10, at the household of Cornelius, the Bible says that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and the way the apostles knew that they were filled with the Holy Ghost as they spoke with tongues and prophesied. The first thing they did was speak in tongues. They also prophesied, but the first thing, the initial thing, was that they spoke in tongues. Now you come over into Acts chapter 19. There were some saints at Ephesus, and the Bible says that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues. The point I'm making is the pattern we see in the book of Acts. We saw it in Acts chapter 2. We saw it in Acts chapter 10. We see it in Acts chapter 19. Now, all these other instances of, of a group of people being filled with the Holy Spirit, we see that the initial physical evidence was speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. I submit to you, hallelujah, I submit to you that it was the same in Acts chapter 8. The Holy Spirit just called something to my attention, and uh, this was not planned. Uh, I had not planned to do this, but I'm going to show you something here. Um, watch this, it, Acts chapter 8. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, um, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now, here's what I wanted to call your attention to in verse 21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. That word translated matter in our King James Version, if you will look at that, now I didn't put this in the notes, this is just something the Holy Spirit brought to my remembrance, but if you look at that word translated matter, in fact, let's see what we have for time. I think I have the time to pull this up, because this is, this is cool. I mean, this is cool. Um, you know, tongues aren't mentioned here in Acts chapter 8, but watch this. I'm going to pull this up. I'm going to pull my uh, Word Study Bible up here. Uh, Technology is a wonderful thing. Let me, uh, praise the Lord, let me get this pulled up. Bear with me here. Talk among yourselves. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. So th this is just, you know, spur of the moment, but this is a, just of the Holy Ghost. Um, I'm going to pull up my Word Study Bible. I'm going to show you something here. Word Study Old and New Testaments here. And I'm going to go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 21. Watch this. 
verse 21. All right, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. The word translated matter there is from the Greek word logos, which is a word or saying also means an account which one gives by word of mouth. So you could say you have neither part nor lot in this communication, this that has come from the mouth, <laughs> this, this, this reason, this reckoning, this saying, this speech, this talk, that's all logos. So you could translate Acts chapter 8, verse 21, you have nor, no part nor lot in that which these people have spoken. Hallelujah. Woo! It is there. It's hidden in the Greek text, but it's there. Now, someone says, Pastor Kevin, are you making that up? Not at all. Not at all. If you have a Strong's Concordance or you have some uh, study tools and you want to check that, please do, because I'm telling you, that's what's there. You have neither part nor lot in this lagos or this speech. So the pattern's there. That's all I'm telling you. Okay? Hallelujah. Woo! Praise the Lord. Now, somebody says... Somebody says, well, was it joy? Were they filled with joy? You know, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, and temperance. Uh, me, <laughs> faithfulness. And I, I can think faster than I can speak. I've told you that before. But, but here's the thing. Was it that they were filled with joy? Well, let's look back here at Acts chapter 8 again. Okay. Now, the Bible says, look there at uh, verse 5 again. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. I wanted you to see verse 8 again. And there was great joy in that city. In other words, there was great joy in that city before they were filled with the Holy Ghost. There was great joy in that city when they got born again. So, so you can't say they were filled with joy and that was the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. No, I want to submit to you, I believe on the authority of God's word, that the same physical evidence, initial physical evidence that we see every other place in the book of Acts when someone is filled with the Holy Ghost is the same one we saw here in Acts. Namely, that they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Praise God. And remember, Peter said to Simon the sorcerer, he says, you have no part nor lot in this logos, in that which was spoken. Praise God. I love it. Hallelujah. Anyway, all right, all right. Well, I tell you, I get cranked up. Praise the Lord. Okay, okay. Now, think about Paul's conversion. Let's come over here to Acts chapter 9, one chapter over. Acts chapter 9, and let's begin reading at verse 1. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard and heard a voice, rather, saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he answered, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Verse 8, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, 
But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Now, what does Romans 10, 9 and 10 say? It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession of Jesus as Lord is made unto salvation. Guess what? Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, later Paul, called and referred to Jesus as Lord. He received the Lordship of Christ on the road to Damascus and was born again by receiving Jesus on that road to Damascus. Now drop down to verse 17. Someone says, well, are you sure about that, Pastor? Yes, I am. Drop down to verse 17 of chapter 9. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, putting his hands on Saul, that is, said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul. We got our grand dog. You're hearing something there. We're babysitting our grand dog. He's been pretty good tonight. I was a little concerned, but if you're hearing a little bit of, you know, a little bit of scratching down there, he's... Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's uh, making his presence known. Playing with some sort of a toy. Playing with a toy. Or, anyway, uh, so just know that that's, if you're hearing a little noise there, that's what it is. But anyway, verse 17, and it, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, Ananias recognized Saul as a brother, as a brother in the Lord. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, the Lord of, of Ananias, the Lord of Paul, the Lord, even Jesus, has appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, has sent Ananias, that thou mightest receive thy sight, number one, be healed, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He was already saved. He'd already received Jesus as Lord on the road to Damascus. But watch this. But watch this. He said, I've been sent not to preach the gospel to you so you'd be born again. He was already saved. He was already a brother. He was already brother Saul. But Ananias was sent to him that he might be healed, that is, receive his sight, number one, and number two, be filled with the Holy Ghost. All I'm showing you here from the Word is that salvation, there is one work of the Spirit in salvation, and there is a subsequent or a work after salvation in being baptized in or filled with the Holy Ghost. And on the authority of God's word, the initial physical evidence of one having been filled with the Holy Ghost is that you will speak in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. That's not the only evidence. It is the initial, though, physical evidence evidence. Praise the Lord. All right. Oh, let's see. Where are we at with time? Oh boy, running out of time. I don't know if I'm, I'm not going to get all this in tonight. So we may have to pick it up next time and then kind of, uh, you know, go from there where we're going to go next. But uh, I got to tell you, if you are tuned in tonight and you have never received the Holy Spirit in, in, in His fullness. You have never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence in, of speaking with other tongues. And you are a believer. You're already saved. But you have never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, you need this second work of the Spirit in your life. It doesn't make you any more saved. It doesn't give you any more of the Holy Spirit in one sense. But what it does is you give the Holy Spirit more of you, and the Holy Ghost comes in, watch this, and he takes the most unruly member of your body, your tongue, and he takes that, and he begins to speak forth mysteries, and begins to speak through you, begins to pray through you. You can receive him tonight. Just say, Jesus Head of the church, baptize me in the Holy Ghost and believe him for it. And now, now what will happen is you will hear right down on the inside of you some syllables, some words that you don't know what they are in your natural mind. You need to speak those out because the Holy Spirit gives the utterance, 
But you and I have to speak it. Okay? Yes. He gives the utterance. You do the speaking. Oh, and, I, and I, we'll, we'll do more teaching on this because I don't have time to enlarge on that. But if you will just, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe most of the folks tuned in tonight, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. But if not, listen, number one, if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, that is, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, that's the first work of the Spirit you need. You need to be born of the Spirit. And then once you're born of the Spirit, you need to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Yes. And we'll talk more about that. Um, we're going to have to close it down tonight. Um, if there's any questions or comments, please chat those in right now. I uh, want to go back and welcome Amy. I think I said hi to Amy a moment ago, but I'm going to say it again. Hi to Amy. Hi to Diane. Uh, Tom, Brother Tom, good to see you. Uh, Brother Alan, Sister Nancy, Sister Linda, always a blessing. If there's others out there you just haven't chatted your presence in, thanks for being here tonight. Um, but I, I wanted to let you know, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock at the church, the Boone Church of God of Prophecy, of course we have church. We're on the corner of 21st and Crawford here in Boone. And um, like I've said, what we're asking people to do in the church is be masked when uh, you are in the church. And the reason for that is our utmost concern is for your health and safety while you're worshiping with us. We want to give you a safe worship experience. We do provide masks. We do provide hand sanitizer. We want you to worship with us. Enjoy San and I. Uh, do our best to lead by example. So while we're interacting with people at the church, we too will be masked. Now, I do take my mask off to preach and lead worship, but then we will put our masks on and be masked you know, while interacting with you in the service. So come on out. We want to make it as safe for you as, you, as we can. 10 o'clock Sunday morning at the church on the corner of 21st and Crawford. And as always, if you can't be at the church physically for whatever reason, we understand that, which is why we offer the live streaming, of course, here on Facebook Live as well. So, you know, either join us in person or join us via um, Facebook Live. We have a lot of folks from a lot of different locations that do join us on Sunday. We're so thankful for that and greatly appreciate it. Uh, one, you know, this is the last time that I'll have the opportunity <laughs> to uh, mention and reference 2020. Know that by Sunday, 2020 will be gone. We'll be into 2021. By the time, Lord willing, we gather next Wednesday here on Bible study, it'll be 2021. So this is the last Wednesday of 2020, the last Wednesday of the year. Uh, Joyce Ann and I want to wish you a blessed new year. We believe for great things in this brand new year of 2021 that it's upon us. And we believe that we want to do more and more to lift up the name of Jesus, to exalt him Amen. in the new year uh, than we did even last year. Get people reached Amen. for the gospel, get folks born again, get them filled with the Holy Ghost, get them healed, get them set free. That's what it's about, Amen. man. That's what it's about. And we want Amen. to see that happen uh, this year more and more oh, and Lord, more. Yes. So uh, any comments or questions before we bring it to a close tonight? Go ahead and chat those in if you have something. Hallelujah. I get fired up. I don't mind telling you when I talk about the Holy Ghost. Maybe next week. Most of you have heard my testimony about being filled with the Spirit. But uh, maybe we'll share that uh, next week for those who maybe have not heard it. If you have heard it, it'll be good to repeat. Uh, just to, you know, testimonies don't bring faith. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by hearing the word. But right on the other hand, testimonies encourage faith. Okay. They encourage people to believe their own needs. So that, that that's, uh, that's good. And uh, thank you, Brother Tom. That's very kind of you. He says, what a great eye-opening Bible study. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Excellent teaching. God bless. Thank you, my brother. That is very kind. And we thank the Lord for you, Brother Tom, and what God is doing in your life, what he will continue to do in 2021 as he continues to do that good work in your body. Praise the and Lord. We are a healed church. We are the healed church. Praise the Lord. We're not a broken church. We're not a disabled church. 
We are a healed church, praise God, because uh, we have relationship with Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah, yeah, Jehovah Jireh, but Jehovah uh, Rapha, Je the Lord, our healer. So praise the Lord. Okay, any, just one last opportunity. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Go ahead, let's uh, chat those in now. Give you one last opportunity for that. Um, it has been uh, our pleasure, Joyce Ann and I. It's been our pleasure once again to be with you yes. um, here on this uh, Wednesday night b via Facebook Live. And, uh, you know, we thank the Lord for this technology. We really do. Um, no, I know it's not the same as being physically in a service. I get that. But right on the other hand, just think about if all of this COVID-19 would have happened before we had all this technology, we'd be totally cut off from one another for the most part. Oh, yeah, you'd have phone calls and su such, but I mean, you wouldn't have any kind of face-to-face -face interaction. <laughs> I'm not crazy about sitting in front of this, let me tell you. Praise so. the Lord. I'm here. Hey, <laughs> she, she said to me tonight, she says, I don't want to be on camera. I always give her that, you know, privilege. She can do what she wants. Uh, she can come on camera. She can not, you know, she's here with me. But uh, amen. Joyce Ann is a blessing to us and, and to me and to you. Praise the Lord. Anyway. Um, I love you all. We love you. And uh, we uh, count it a privilege to share the word and to fellowship yes. with you and, you know, to be in the family of God together with you. It's a, it's a blessing and a privilege. Um, uh, anyway, we, 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 we believe good things coming up in uh, 2021. But uh, let's just close tonight's session. If no one else has anything, let's go ahead and close it with a blessing, with the benediction, and say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now we bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We bless you to be a blessing. We declare you are blessed. Everything you set your hands to prospers in this new year. And yes. you are the head and not the tail. You are above only and not beneath. You are the healed, not the sick. You are the strong, not the weak. You are the prosperous, not the broke. Praise God. God is yes. working in yes. you and through yes. you. And your light so shines that others may see that light in this dark world mm -hmm. and come to Jesus. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. And Linda says, thank you, Pastor. Hi, Joyce. She's Linda saying hi to you. Blessings to you, Sister Linda. You are a blessing. And I think she and you at least one time have kind of been, what, sewing buddies or craft buddies? or No, we were talking about uh, tatting. Tatting, that's what it was. I, All right. I, I like tatting and she was learning. That's right. So. Okay, it's been a while back, but I, I remembered that. So uh, yeah. anyway, so we, 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 it was always a blessing to see dear Sister Linda. I don't get a see you in person that often, but uh, it's always a blessing uh, to do that, and it's always a good blessing to interact with you on uh, Facebook as well. Anyway, folks, we just thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight, and uh, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that this is the victory that the overcomes the world, even our faith. faith. The Lord bless you tonight.